In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Indeed, and welcome one and all folks who have been attending church for a thousand years, those who have just stumbled in here to the door on your way to Trader Joe's and drawn in by the holy ruckus, and everyone in between. Welcome, in the name of the Lord, welcome to all of us. Each one of us has been drawn here this morning by a, savor, a source of divine love that is impossible for us to adequately name and indeed greater than our ability to comprehend. And yet, we are all, each of us here, to mark the anniversary of that first Easter morning when things didn't go as expected and searing loss was turned to radiant joy. Stuart Hoke, our Holy Week preacher who has been with us for the Triduum, the Great Three Days. And if you were thinking you'd get him this morning, I'm sorry. Um, but come back next week. He will be back here for the second Sunday of Easter. <clears throat> but he has been with us through those great three days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, the first observance of Easter. On Thursday, Stuart led us through the idea that we hear again on Thursday, Maundy Thursday, that love is our highest duty. And then on Friday, when love hung from a cross and took all of our sorrows with him there. And then last night, when we heard the first sounds of Easter, we heard the broadest possible account of the history of God's creation, beginning with Genesis and ending with the sacrament of new birth for two young adults and new members of our community. A baptism into the very death and life of Jesus. And in history not so ancient, but which feels like a long time ago now, we recently entered into Lent on Ash Wednesday, when many of us presented ourselves here at this altar rail to receive the imposition of ashes as a sign of our mortality, an outward and visible sign of our mortality. And over the 40 days of Lent, a number of you have reached out to tell me that what you heard in that sermon that day has sustained you in some very important ways. And so for those who weren't able to be with us, or if you have forgotten, that's forgivable, that sermon's main message, simple message, was this. Live like you are going to die. The message of Ash Wednesday is live like you are going to die because you are, you are. It's startling on its face, but nevertheless it is true that each one of us here will have a lifespan on this earth. For some of us longer, for some of us shorter, but whatever its length, all of it is unfolding in the light of God's grace. So live like you're going to die. The awareness of the span of our earthly life can lead us to some less than life-giving places, as we talked about. For example, hedonism, or whoever dies with the most toys wins. An awareness of our relatively short span of life, however, can also lead us to other things. It can lead us to hedonism. It can lead us to being paralyzed by fear and avoiding risk at all costs, which is its own sort of living death, isn't it? But also an awareness of the finite span of our lives can lead us to lead, truly lead lives where we're living. Leading us to truly live, it can give us a sense of urgency about what we do with the time we're given. What are we doing with this life? It is a certain sort of inspiration. It is a certain sort of freedom 
to know that our time is limited, but our love is not. And then there is this day. Today, the other end of the Lenten jury journey, in, in today's gospel, we hear that the tomb is empty. And we hear another simple exhortation to us from God. Live like the power of death has died, because it has. The power of death over you and me has died. And it died on that day when Jesus left the tomb and showed us that God will have the last word. Early in the morning, still in darkness, Mary went to Jesus' tomb, intending not to have a conversation with him. That's not what she was there for. She was there to mourn at the body of her friend. At first, Mary's grief is compounded because her friend and mentor suddenly dead, and now in the midst of her grief, what appears to be yet a further blow, she can't even grieve in peace because Jesus' body is gone. And at first, she is blinded by the loss and her understandable desperation, so much so that when Jesus first speaks to her, she cannot recognize him. Fear blocks out so much. Anger also blinds us. And it is not until Jesus calls her by her name, Mary. It's not until that moment that reality, what was real and true, cuts through for her and relationship is restored. And you and I know this feeling. We live in troubling times, loss, personal and collective. It surrounds us. Recently, I've had so many conversations where people are saying, I'm not sure we actually processed what happened to us in COVID. We've just kept trucking along, and here we are. Loss, personal and collective, is our companion. We mourn the brokenness that we can see, and we fear what may come next. And when you and I are living in fear, when we live our lives as though death, capital D, has the last word, we are blind. Since the time of the great prophet Hosea, God has been telling us that the power that animates the universe is in fact the ultimate word. Death, I will be your death. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction, says the prophet, giving voice to God's word to you and me, that we are to understand that in the conversation between God and anything else, God wins. God wins. Life wins. Like Mary, at first, we can be blind to God in our very midst, so fixed on death that we cannot see life and love staring us in the face. But the Easter message is this, that death gets to speak, but death does not have the last word. That word belongs to God, it belongs to love, it belongs to life, and our participation in the life of this church reminds us of that truth every Easter and every Sunday and every day that we gather in Christ's love. As Stuart so powerfully proclaimed at last night's Easter vigil and baptisms, we are not baptized into a timid, tepid, vapid faith that evaporates when the going gets tough, for such a faith is useless. Because if we live long enough, the disasters will come. No, when we come to the waters of baptism, we are plunged into depths that we cannot see. We are baptized not into a polite society of tedious and boringly bland people. We are baptized into the very death and the very risen life of Jesus the Christ. And this means 
that when we confront all of the deaths that come our way, loss of job or relationship, a serious diagnosis, a sense that a way of life that we have valued and cherished is passing into history, or just any of the garden variety losses that come from our essential human powerlessness as we watch, for example, the agony of our sisters and brothers around the world caught in conflicts not of their making. When we confront these moments of deep anguish, we are in truth met by none other than Christ himself. Our panic blindness or rage may obscure our understanding of it, but there is no doubt, let there be no doubt, that God is right with us and when necessary, calling each of us by our name, calling us by our name. And so, my friends, as we go back out into this joyful Easter day with its celebrations, we claim that other bookend to our Ash Wednesday message. In Ash Wednesday, I said, live like you're going to die. And today I say, love like you know that death has already died. God has vanquished it and set us free. Amen.